Friends, welcome back to Being in Making Disciples. In this episode, we are very excited to welcome the author or one of the authors of this book, Catholic Leadership for Civil Society by Christopher Pereira and Aaron Monin. And Christopher was gracious enough to join us tonight to speak about this book. So Christopher, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the invitation, Dan. I'm honored. It's my pleasure. Well, um, this book is, uh, in a lot of a lot of ways, I think the answer to to prayers, and I think the answer to the call of all of the Holy Fathers in recent memory of inviting the lay people to do more, to really take up this invitation from Jesus. And um, the way that when I read it, uh, this was one of the things I came away with: that you are inviting people to. And the title kind of points to this, but what I think you're doing, correct me if I'm wrong, is inviting people to accept Jesus's invitation to go into the world and sanctify it, not retreat from it, but instead go into all of the corners of human experience and bring the gospel there. Is that accurate? That is a beautiful, beautiful summary of, of the message. Uh, yes, I completely agree. I think you totally get it, Dan. Another way of putting it is we feel that we're trying to change the chip in the minds of lay Catholics that that we are of the impression, Aaron, my co-author and I, that for the longest time have been a little confused about the proper role of the lady within the church and our true vocation as lady, right? So we feel that as lady, our role should be to be ambassadors of Christ out in the world and not to live in this Catholic bubble where we keep just evangelizing ourselves over and over. I mean, True, we all need continuous formation and being we must be involved with our parish community, right? And all of these things are good, but we must also be out in the world. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, you can you can point to any number of scripture verses uh, in the Gospels where Jesus invites us to go into the world. I mean, the like be salt, be light, those kind of verses. It's clear we're not supposed to hide. Um, I want to say somebody told me you have a saying one time, don't park at the parish. Um, which I, <laughs> I don't know if that was you of, or if I'm, if I'm misquoting that, but either way, it's, I agree uh, with it. Yeah. It's not park. I, I say this a lot. And, and at this point that you can find it on social media a lot. I, I keep saying, um, that many lay Catholics, unfortunately, because which is, I mean, our, the, our intentions are good, which is want to serve mother church and we want to give back and we want to find our place in the church and, and, and be, get involved. So we sometimes go back to the parish and sign up for every ministry that we can and sometimes set up a tent and camp at the parish. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's not a our vocation. Verse. No, no, yeah. <laughs> I think Jesus warned the apostles not to do that at one point, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, he might have in, in so many words. So yeah, many yeah. Ways. Why do you think that's such an easy route for, for people to go? To just say, okay, well, I'm I'm you know, let's say it's an adult who's kind of had a conversion later in life or a reversion back to the faith and they say, I want to give it all to Jesus. Why do they, why do they gravitate towards parish life rather than going into the world? Because they don't know what else to go. I, I mean, we, I think we all understand, you understand very well that for the past few decades, the lady has been suffered from very poor and weak catechesis and formation, right? So we're not well formed. But typically, we are encountering these uh, lay Catholics who are having experiences of encounter with Christ, maybe at, in their adult, adult lives or even in, in their middle uh, age years. And for the longest time, they have been walking in the world and living their life sort of disconnected with their, with their Catholic faith, right? And at some point in their life, they rediscover their Catholic faith, or they have an experience of encounter or re-encounter with Christ. And they're so fired up. They're on fire, right? They're, they're so, uh, they have a thirst to serve and to give back and to just continue to grow closer to Christ. And they don't know where to find this. They don't know how to do this. The logical uh, place for them to look at is the church, their own yeah. parish. They will look at their, their pastor, their priest, and they'll check out the parish and see what they can get involved with. That is just logical. But if the church had a better um, structure and some system, systems in place so that we could guide these Catholics who have just recently had an experience of encounter 
or re-encounter with Christ and help them understand what their true vocation is and what their true role as lady is in the church, I think they'll immediately get it and just go out and be fishers of men. That's a that's a pretty good goal. <laughs> and I mean, it's, again, it's coming right from Jesus. There was um, there was a really powerful line actually on the back of the book that I really stood out to me, and I wanted to ask you about it. So it's the um, the last sentence of the description of the book. This okay. is the hour of the laity, which I, I love. I think some people might, uh, out of a great respect for the priesthood and religious life, think, well, isn't that their job? Isn't it the, isn't, aren't they the ones we should look to for examples of holiness? Um, how would you respond to that? Well, uh, first of all, that the church has never said you won't find it anywhere in the magisterial, magisterial documents, uh, writings of the saints or the popes, that holiness was only for the clergy, for religious people. The church has never said that. Jesus Christ has never said that. Nobody has said this. There was it was it was sort of assumed because for the longest time the most notorious examples of holiness were coming from the clergy. And I think maybe in the Middle Ages, we just got accustomed to that. But it was never church teaching that holiness was exclusive to the lay to the clergy. So the hour of the lady is something that has been really we're, here. We're coining a phrase by Archbishop Jose Gomez mm. of Los Angeles, who is a very strong supporter of the work that we do and actually uh, wrote the foreword for our book. Yeah, the yeah. Us with that. So why the hour of the lady, Dan? If you take a look at everything that's happening in society right now and everything that has happened in the church as well, so in and outside the church, everything that has transpired over, over the past few decades, Unfortunately, uh, while we know that most of the clergy, bishops and priests are holy men of, of God, men and, and, and for those uh, people in re religious life, nuns uh, and women who are people who are committed uh, to the mission of the church and, and people who aspire to holiness, we also know of the uh, rotten apples that have mm -hmm. fallen away from the tree yeah. And in recent years, unfortunately, have done a lot to damage the image of the church and even, even the trust that the, that the world and lay Catholics have for the leaders of the church, for the, for the hierarchy of the church, right? What needs to be done for that particular issue to be resolved and for us to regain that trust that we must have in our pastors, in our leaders. Well, that's a different field, a different space. But because we are here now at this intersection where a lot of trust has been lost in the, the hierarchy of the church, and we live in a world where a lot of the problems that we see sprawling up are coming from, we are convinced, convinced a lack of principled, uh, really virtuous leadership in society, this is a time that is prime, prime for lay people like you and I to step up and fill the gaps, meet the needs of our communities and lead. You know, Dan, it used to be, if you look at the history of the United States and the history of migration and Catholic migration, Catholic immigrants, historical communities like the Poles and the Irish and the Germans and, and the Italians, it used to be that lay Catholics would be leaders because they were Catholics. Mm. Our faith compelled us, used to compel us to lead in our own communities, right? And we have all of these hospitals and universities and, and schools and, and the Knights of Columbus, all of these wonderful institutions started by Catholics. They became leaders simply because they were Catholics. We are trying to get back to that. I like that a lot. Um, in the... I have this this idea. What's coming to me is actually the way uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared to the Mexican people as one of their own, and in the same sense, like the the priesthood right now, because of those rotten apples, has lost a lot of trust and credibility in the eyes of the world. But lay people like you and me, we can say, "Well, I'm not leaving the church, and I'm still Catholic." And I want you to know that just because there were some sinful people in the church does not mean in any way 
that uh, that that weakens my faith in Jesus. And exactly. um, there's there's places that we can go. I mean, all those the, those these great lay leaders. Um, there's places we can go that priests and religious cannot by virtue of their vocation. I mean, the, the church forbids uh, ordained from holding political office, uh, rightly exactly. so. Um, which means that if we're supposed to sanctify every part of the world, we can't express, expect a priest to go there. Um, and I really like what you said that it was they, those immigrants who came to this country, um, who were really kind of the first waves of Catholics because the settlers largely weren't Catholic. They took up leadership positions because they were Catholic. And I think today, if there's a Catholic leader, they are not a leader because they're Catholic. Maybe they thought, well, this would be a fun career or this would give me great influence or this would be lucrative, but not, this is what the Lord is calling me to do. Absolutely. I, I can't agree more with you than, and I'm glad you, you uh, took the conversation in this direction because um, another thing that we say in the book and that we feel very strongly about is that, first of all, this isn't a new message. This isn't our message. We believe that we are bringing uh, up to the surface, a neglected, a forgotten message of the church. We believe that the call for the lady to uh, really enter society and transform it from within, to renew the temporal order, to sanctify the world, it's a, the call that comes from the Second Vatican Council. As you know, many people that talk about the Second Vatican Council, faithful, good willing Catholics, tend to focus on the changes in the liturgy and the ecumenical aspects of the culture. And unfortunately, then Catholics will argue about those all day long. Yeah. But the one aspect that we think keeps being neglected and we really miss the mark is that the Second Vatican Council had in an urgent, bold challenge to the lady to lead in society. You're, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there and that it's, it's unfortunate that there are those, uh, those arguments about, okay, well, what did, what did the council mean about the liturgy and that kind of stuff? And they're missing this main thing. I mean, it's like, okay, there's people who are meant to handle the discussion about the, the liturgy and that's the magisterium. That's the church hierarchy. But like for me, what did, what does the second Vatican council say to me as a lay person? Exactly that go into the world, be light to the nations. And uh, there's no, it's, that's not controversial. I mean, there's nothing to debate about that. It's, that's the, the command of Jesus in so many ways. I mean, it's his last words and it's echoed up and down throughout all the gospels. And so that's a great point. So, uh, so friends, where do you hear this then? Where do you hear this? I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, where no worries. Do we, hear, we don't hear this. We don't hear this message from the, from anybody really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you picked up the mantle. I mean, it's kind of <laughs> echoing your point. If it's the hour of the lady, there's right now there are. It's a minority still, but there's so many, uh, so many good, devout lay people who have picked up this uh, this mantle and said, "Okay, the church is asking me to become a leader, so I'm going to do that." Uh, and you and Aaron have done that by writing this book and by reminding everybody, like this is not only this is what we're supposed to do, but this is how we're supposed to do it. And um, this is now it's probably if you don't mind, I'd love to talk briefly about the Tepeyac Leadership Institute, because I, I would imagine that it would be difficult in your mind to separate what's in in this book and what you're doing with Tepeyac, right? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, the book is an organic development of the work that we have been doing for the past six years. You have been involved with it as well, Dan, and have been a strong supporter of Tepeyac Leadership Initiative. We um, basically have been forming leaders lay leaders, but not leaders for ministry or for the parish, Catholic leaders for civil society. Yeah. So for a few years now, we began to, to feel that we needed to encapsulate the vision of the work that we have been doing through our five-month leadership development program, TLI. Uh, so the book now becomes a resource for graduates of Tepeyac leadership to take with them something they can always go back to and remind them of uh, how they were sent off right, to be leaders in civil society. But it's also a resource for anybody that might not get an, ex uh, an opportunity to experience TLI. It really is, we, we feel, a um, valuable resource on its own, right? But it's definitely a development of the, of the program. And this is a mission that we feel very passionate about, Dan. We feel that um, this is a very important time to invest in leaders, 
for America and for the rest of the world. Yeah, and I, I think the, like you said, I mean, that was, that was part of the Second Vatican Council's call. And you can go back to every single pope since then. And a message to me that is clear in every single one of them is an invitation and a summons for you and me and our fellow uh, brothers and sisters in the church who are laity to, to, to rise up to be leaders and to live the gospel in whatever way they're supposed to. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean we're all supposed to run for office. It doesn't mean we're all mm -hmm. supposed to start a hospital, but there's something we are all supposed to do in living that call to holiness. And to the extent that we do that, that's when we'll see the renewal of the church in the world and a, a greater love of Jesus Christ. And uh, if there's a job to be done, it's, it's mine. Absolutely. And, and it's different for everybody, just like you said. We believe that by virtue of our baptism, all of us have been called to lead, right? And it's difficult for the Catholic mind sometimes, for the lay Catholic mind, to think of ourselves as leaders because we like to think of ourselves as followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we are. Yeah. But we like to turn that around and, and we say to our program participants and readers of the book, because we are followers of Christ, we're also called to lead others to Christ. So we're all called to lead. We're all called to lead. And the book really, and this is why the subtitle is A Practical Guide, because we this book is not high in the clouds theology. This is a very simple message, as you know, Dan. And we show a roadmap and we show the lady practical ways in which we can lead in, in our own communities. Like you say, we don't have to run for president of the United States. Some, hopefully, God willing, a good Catholic, one day will be called to that. Uh, we haven't seen one in recent years, but uh, hopefully. But for most, we have identified other areas that are prime for civic leadership, for Catholics to engage civic leadership, healthcare, education, business, government, news media. And within all those fields, we have identified one that we believe is the probably the premier field for Catholic leadership in civil society, and that is board service then. Why? Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Sure. Because most of the things that have taken place in the culture in the past few decades, those things that worry you and I, that we faithful Catholics are really concerned about, right? In education, for example, the things, the unfortunate ideologies that are being taught in some public education, uh, public districts, school districts, maybe in California, for example, yeah. or the things, uh, unethical uh, practices that are taking place place in science or the medical field, right? There was a time when the when a group of people were sitting around the table and decisions were made that led to those changes in the culture. So yeah, our question yeah. is, where were the Catholics? If they were at the table, surely they were not well-formed or they were not courageous enough to stand up for truth. And what we're inviting Catholics to consider is Instead of finding their place in the church as Catholic leaders in ministry, which there is nothing wrong with, maybe there is more opportunity out in civil society. Ultimately, what we want then is one more faithful and committed Catholic voices at every table where decisions are made. Those decisions that impact the culture. That makes a lot of sense. And strategically, that's genius because it gives somebody such a big platform without them needing to be a great public speaker or extraordinarily charismatic, or even um, you, you don't have to have a degree in philosophy or theology to understand church teaching. I mean, this, you can go as deep as you want to in the intellectual tradition of the church, which is beautiful, but just the, a regular lay person with goodwill and an open mind and open heart can learn so much about the faith really in, in not that much time, such that when they go into those very influential positions, like say being on a hospital board. So, uh, so I'm thinking of several years ago when there was a religious sister who was the president of a Catholic hospital and she approved of an abortion at that hospital, which I mean, it kind of blows my mind that a religious sister at a Catholic hospital can do that. And uh, I don't remember what happened, but I want to say the bishop removed her and may have, have made a formal excommunication just of... of I mean, a declaration. I remember of... the story, Dan, because it, it happened in my diocese. And okay, yeah, his... yeah. <laughs> it was, unfortunately, I won't mention the, the hospital. It's all yeah, over yeah. Uh, YouTube, mm -hmm. but it was that unfortunate decision that Bishop Olmsted forced Bishop Olmsted to remove.
the Catholic designation uh, of this hospital. And yeah, he said yeah. that the hospital was no longer a Catholic hospital. And it wasn't him who has communicated this sister. She had has communicated herself by making yeah, that decision. Exactly. That's what he explained. Yeah, yeah. No, that, and that, um, but had there been the right people in place on that board? Yes. Because you know there is somebody who was probably pressuring her or who at some point said, this isn't a big deal. And they were probably Catholic or they were probably Catholic people on that board. And I don't know. I, I don't want to I don't want to jump to conclusions here. But um, had there been better leadership, that would have never happened. And it's, it's think, one example. Yeah, it's one yeah. good example. But but you think about I begin. I, I'm very hopeful now that I begin to see parents and many of them Catholic parents waking up to what's happening in public school districts and now mm. getting involved. And this is what the book is calling for. And this is what TLI has been calling for for six years. And we're beginning to see this, right? These parents showing up at, at the public school districts and, and voicing their opinion in terms of all of these ideologies that are being uh, filtered through the, the curriculum. Yeah, I've heard it described as the long march to the institution. And there's all, especially in government, there's all of these positions that are not elected that are so influential. If you think, for instance, um, the... The people who are the head of, for instance, something like um, the Department of Health and Human Services, um, who I think it was under the, the Obama administration, um, issued that the director of HHS issued the mandate for um, Catholic businesses to provide abortion and birth control services as part of their insurance company. Well, mm -hmm. that person's not elected, yet they are, they have the authority, they're appointed. That person has the authority that's almost legislative. And those are the, the kind of positions. Granted, you know, that's a, that not many people are going to be appointed to that. But there's, as you said, I mean, there's thousands of school boards throughout the country where people could, um, could become a leader and be influential in that same way, not in the same magnitude, but in that same way on the local level. And if there was a groundswell of people who did that, then in 30 years, the country would look entirely different. Absolutely. And and we, we in the book, we expand, we really push the boundaries of the concept of board service because we say by board service, this is what we mean. We definitely do mean actual boards, governance boards, advisory boards, fundraising boards for nonprofits and for-profit organizations, faith-based or non-faith-based. But we also mean your local uh, lions or rotary clubs. We mean your homeowners association, your parent teacher association, really any civic organization, institution, guild yeah. that you can be a part of. And as a well-formed Catholic, exert some influence. So we're telling to lay Catholics, stop being so shy about it and look at it, not a, a, a selfish way to advance yourself, but in, on the contrary, a truly a responsibility, a duty as a baptized Catholic to influence society for Christ. Amen. Absolutely. Well, let's, with that, let's jump a little bit more into the book. And friends, if you're, if you uh, missed it at the beginning, so we are talking about Catholic Leadership for Civil Society by Christopher Pereira and Aaron Monin. This is available on Amazon and we will link to it in the show notes so that uh, you can, if, whether you're listening from Apple or Spotify or, or whichever of your favorite platform, the link to the book on Amazon is going to be there. Um, so we're talking about uh, how Catholics can be leaders in civil society. And I wanted to ask, um, were there any chapters that kind of stand out to you as being either your favorite to write or the most difficult to uh, to really put your ideas together? Yeah, so this is the great thing about partnering up with somebody so talented as Erin that we were able to really uh, work off each other's strengths and, and maybe weaknesses too, right? So she was so great. At, I had a, a very clear vision in my mind for what the, the chapter on the Second Vatican Council would be. But there, the Second Vatican Council, and I've read all the documents of the Second Vatican Council, is so rich in information. We were looking really for those documents that talk directly, specifically to the lady. And we needed to really filter from all of that wealth of information, the, the paragraphs that more boldly and clearly, concisely spoke to the message of the book. So that was truly a challenging uh, chapter that I'm glad that Erin 
was there to to contribute to. Uh, on my end, I, I find that the chapter on board service, for example, I thought I was worried, concerned that this chapter was going to be boring for some people. And I am very relieved to hear the feedback from people that they really, uh, the message from that chapter has resonated with people. They finally see a connection between board service and advancing the common good. That is, that's so cool to hear, you know, that um, probably as you were struggling with that and, and wrestling with all those ideas to think, okay, what's the best way to connect and resonate with people? Uh, that, that, I mean, that really did bear fruit and the people in their, their feedback to you said, no, 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 that one really does strike me. Yeah. Yeah. That was very surprising. Right. And then, I mean, we've never written a book before, so we, we really pour our hearts and, and, and work into this project. How do you start? The first chapter always has to really grab the attention of the reader. And how do you end? You got to end strong. So we were all always, of course, concerned about the beginning and the end of the book. So it's a process, it's a long process, but we truly felt that it was a prayerful process that, that we uh, were graced by the Holy Spirit to uh, guide us through because we look at the book now, Erin and I, and we are like, how did we put this together? How did this happen? And we're so grateful and honored that we were able to. That's, well, I'm so glad you did. Um, one of the chapters that really grabbed my attention was titled, We Cannot Be All, We Can All Be Theologians or Apologists. And um, this, this is perfect for our audience because one of the things we talk about a lot is how um, we're, we're all called to evangelism. I mean, the, the title of the podcast, Being and Making Disciples, this is for everybody. And we can't expect that everybody's going to get a master's in theology. And it, or an advanced degree in, in a pastoral related field. Yet we know we're all called to evangelize. And as you've, you've uh, reminded us to make the world holy. Um, and if that, let's say everybody did that, um, the church would be so ill-equipped to interact with the world because we wouldn't have those leaders to go out there and show people, this is what an authentically Christian society looks like. Um, I think you've already, one of the questions I had was how can we help more people em, kind of embrace that call to go out into the world? I think you've already made a, a very clear case for that, um, as well as kind of why we have a tendency to go back. But um, is there anything you would add, let's say to to those people who, you know, they they recently have fallen in love with the Lord again, and they're they're recommitting to the church, and they, they want to know where to direct their passion? What yeah, well, would you I, say to them? I would just invite them to think about it logically. We couldn't, like you just said it, uh, say we, we couldn't have every, and, and the majority of the church is made out of lay people, right? We make up the most of the body of the church. We couldn't have every lay person become a theologian or an apologist. It just wouldn't work, yeah. right? And if we did, who would be the lawyers, the business people, the doctors who will be influencing their professional fields according to the values of the gospel? Who? Who would do it? If everybody would run to get a theology, a master's in theology. And one of the things that really concerns me, Dan, is that this is something that I see very often, that these people that have had a recent encounter or encounter with Christ, they're trying to find their way to serve the church. And a professional who might otherwise be very successful and influential in his or her own field, again, in medicine or law or government or whatever it might be, news media, God knows we need more Catholic journalists out there. They feel that they wanna, they need to go back and get a master's in theology. And I'm just thinking, why? We have enough theologians. I'm not saying that for some, that's not their vocation. For, me, for some, that would be their vocation. But yeah. it can't be the vocation of most. And if we just feel the need and have a duty, to continue to form ourselves in the faith and grow in knowledge of our Catholic faith, that doesn't require for us to go out and get a theology, a master's in theology. We don't need to do that. We must, what we must do is see how our Catholic faith can become the compass, the compass that will help us lead in our professional lives. Amen. And I, uh, I could not agree with you more. Um, you know, oftentimes people, they, I think they, think of um, the apostles um, like St. Peter and then, of course, the great evangelist St. Paul as these these like brilliant theologians. Um, and one of my professors actually pointed out, it's like, no, no, Paul wasn't a theologian because he didn't have time 
to sit and ponder and think about all these things because he was too busy spreading the gospel. And um, Paul, most people don't know this, Paul had a job. He was a tent maker and okay. he chose that career so that he could easily travel or probably he chose that career so he could easily travel and be in contact with lots of people. And so something that I think Catholics could borrow from the, a Protestant spirit of evangelization is to choose a career that allows for uh, good mobility and good life, kind of a life sufficiency so that we can provide for our needs and still have time to evangelize and be involved in the, in the world and be leaders in the world. So to be in it, but not of it. Um, and had St. Paul said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to, I'm going to go the church route. I'm going to stay back in Jerusalem. Christianity would not have spread like it did. I mean, we might still be a Middle Eastern religion rather than a, a worldwide global one. So um, I love that. I think you, uh, you and Aaron give so many uh, clear examples of ways we can get involved and kind of good, good reminders like this one, like that chapter I pointed out of um, how the church may, or how God may be calling us. And it's not to say that, you know, like maybe you are a very successful uh, marketer or, or working in, in news media or something. You can go ahead and get the masters if you want, but don't, please don't leave your career because we need you there uh, in order to continue to evangelize there. I can give you a very good example then of a friend of mine who, because she knows the work of the work that I do, and she's actually involved with TLI. Uh, recently, she's a journalist. She's an anchor in her own town. She's a main anchor. Everybody knows her in town. She gives the news at 10 p.m. Uh, every night. And at one point, she was confronted by one of her supervisors because of some, some type, some decision she was making, some editorial decision she was trying to uh, advocate for. And she was uh, accused of the following. They told her, oh, so you're trying to advance your Catholic agenda. They told her that. And she, she, she and what she was doing, she was just giving her opinion. She didn't think she was pushing for any agenda at all. But this is what they told her. She was so frustrated with that. She went back to me. She shared that with me. And she said, Christopher, I don't know what to do. This has never happened to me before. Maybe I should just leave secular media and go work in Catholic media. And I told her, no, please don't do that. Can you imagine if the state of the media is what it is now, as such, with so few Catholics in media, what would it become if the little, the few that we have in places like where you are would leave? No, we need you there. We need more Catholics like you. Yeah, yeah. It's never going to be perfect. And I think um, it's it's not perfect in the church. And people might sometimes get the this, this uh perception that, oh, it would be so great to work in the church where so so many people are committed to loving God. And my experience working in and out of the church is um, everybody is sinful and everybody struggles. And there's yes. there's wonderful people that I work with in the church, uh, but I also worked with really wonderful people in uh, in private industry and in, in public education and secular society. And so uh, it, the grass isn't greener on the other side. Um, and so if it's just because like you said, oh, you know, is am I really able to live my faith here? I think, I mean, it's always a case of discernment and pray and ask the Lord what to do. But yeah, we need people to stay in positions like that. Yeah, I think that as people of faith, we we cannot believe in coincidence. There's no such a thing as coincidence. And our book and the work that we do speaks uh, especially to professionals. If God has blessed us with a professional career, with a college education, and he has placed us in a specific place uh, that's because that was meant to be our field of mission it's not a coincidence that's our mission and right there that job we can sanctify it and we can sanctify the world through it we don't need to change we don't need to go somewhere else we just need to prayerfully prayerfully discern how can we make this this place this job this career my path to holiness amen well that's that's a perfect summary of, uh, of this conversation. So it's probably a good place to, to stop. Um, so friends, again, this is Catholic Leadership for Civil Society, and you can pick it up on Amazon. We're going to link to it in show notes. This is written by Christopher Pereira, who is gracious enough to join us here, as well as Aaron Monin, his co-author. And um, you can learn more about uh, Tepiac Leadership Initiative that we, we spoke about. Is that TLI.org? It's TLIprogram.org. TLIprogram.org. And that is a, um, a leadership preparation program for Catholics who want to do the, the kind of things that Christopher is speaking about. Um, 
And I have partnered with them uh, to do some of the work in preparing the participants. And it's really, really wonderful. The, the content is great. And so if you're interested in, in learning more about this, I would encourage you. So that's tliprogram.org. Well, Christopher, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It was a pleasure to speak with you, connect a little bit more and talk about uh, not only this book, but also TLI a little bit and uh, share and remind people of what the church is inviting them to as far as what it means to be a Catholic living in the world. Dan, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Well, thank you so much. God bless you. And friends, God bless you. Know that we are praying for you and look forward to being with you again next time. Peace.